see that? All right, so I got a thumbs up that you can see my screen. So we'll get started here. Um, again, my name is Dana LeWinter. I am the Director of Municipal Engagement here at CHAPA. Thank you for being with us today for our, um, our first year's regional meeting. Um, I first wanna thank our regional meeting sponsor, uh, Bank of America, um, for making it possible for these meetings to happen across the Commonwealth. This is our seventh regional meeting. We have one left. Um, and we've, it's been really exciting to be able to do this work with all of you. I wanna thank our local um, participating co-hosts who you will hear from later as we go through the session. Um, Berkshire County Regional Housing Authority, the Central Berkshire Habitat for Humanity, and Berkshire Housing Development Corporation. So um, we here at CHAPA are a statewide affordable housing organization. We encourage the production of um, and preservation of homes that are affordable to households with low and moderate incomes. And we foster diverse and sustainable neighborhoods through planning and community development. Um, for more than 50 years, we have advocated for opportunity at the local, state, and federal levels. We've worked to expand access to housing through coordination of the Massachusetts Home Ownership Collaborative, uh, monitoring thousands of affordable homes across the state and administering mass access. And we developed the affordable housing field through trainings, forums, our Young Professionals Network, and a mentorship program that we run with the Mel King Institute. CHAPA brings together a broad group of stakeholders, and we believe that together we can build a better future for everyone in the Commonwealth. This is something we've always done in Massachusetts, shaping the future that we want for ourselves. The affordable housing challenges facing our state right now put us at risk of losing the very things that make Massachusetts so great. And as you all know, the urgency of the COVID pandemic and the racial injustices demand that we rethink who we are and what we want to be as a Commonwealth. So the decisions that we make now will determine our future and done well, we can ensure that every person can find an affordable home in the community of their choice. There are big challenges ahead, many of which we'll talk about today. We wanna to hear from you too, because we know our goals are achievable. Um, we can make sure that every person in Massachusetts has the ability to live in a safe, healthy, and affordable home in the community that they choose. So we're, our um, agenda today, I'm really excited for it. Um, we're gonna hear first from our CHAPA policy team about some state and federal updates and our priorities at CHAPA. We'll also hear from CHAPA's fair housing efforts um, at what we're working on there and our municipal engagement initiative model. We'll be hearing from our regional co-sponsors on the challenges and opportunities they see for this region throughout the session. And we also wanna hear from you because you know your communities better than anyone else. So please share your challenges, strategies, and concerns so that we can all learn from you. Um, and with that, I am going to hand it over to my colleague, Abby, to talk about our policy updates. Abby. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'm the policy associate, and together with Ryan and our policy direct director, Eric Chopin, we uh, our policy team works on uh, advocacy, state advocacy, uh, and overall, you know, putting together our um, policy agenda and making sure we um, get that done through the um, legislature. So just a lot has been going on over the last year. And I just want to, you know, provide some updates or, and the work that we have been doing on the budget side, as well as the legislative uh, side with, with the legislature and the administration. Uh, we, but before I go into that, I just want to give a quick overview of um, the huge uh, housing choice legislation that was passed through um, the economic development bill, uh, which passed like the end of last session, which was, you know, early this year, and that sort of uh, brought together zoning reforms um, to chapter 40A, which were like really significant because this happened after a long time and there are significant reforms for our um, zoning laws across the state and hopefully I mean our, our intention with all of this was to bring together transportation and housing together to make sure they're integrated and the development that we want um, is sort of in that direction with smart growth zoning practices and making sure that we are uh, opening up communities and giving them the tools to do that so that everybody has uh, you know opportunities for housing. Um, so this uh, this change applies to all cities uh, except Boston. Uh, it's currently in effect and it provides certain zoning ordinances bylaws to be enacted by a simple majority. 
instead of a super majority because that was something that we saw as a barrier for many housing developments where simply by a couple of votes um, major and really great housing developments with affordable housing with affordable units were um, turned down simply because it did not have a super majority and so we are really happy to see that uh, uh, getting passed it's currently in effect and um, the great thing is uh, the great thing is that it it doesn't I mean it, it does come with uh, you know sort of the carrot and stick approach where if if you're not abiding by these then there is there are certain uh, grants that you do not get uh, you know access to so we are we are glad that it's a really strong law uh, going quickly through that. Uh, as I said, it provides simple majority for certain zoning ordinances for smart growth. It also has a multifamily uh, requirement for MBTA municipalities, uh, which which are not you know which are only the ones that have access to MBTA, and also changes some um, or, or makes changes for streamlining certain permitting and a butter appeals reform, which also have been a big barrier for many of the housing developments. Um, DHCD is yet to issue guidance for many of these changes because the devil is in the details and so there are some things that will be uh, that will be more uh, clear once we have the DHCD's guidance and we are glad that DHCD is taking input from um, many organizations and stakeholders for uh, getting that devised. So please stay tuned on that. Uh, I'm just going to quickly run through the MBTA stuff. Uh, I know many towns here are not uh, in that purview, but it simply allows a buy a certain certain kinds of housing by right with simple majority, uh, and it also allows for uh, certain kinds of housing developments by special permit, which are listed here. If you have any, uh, if you want to know more, please uh, please get to the uh, links that we'll be providing that are more in depth uh, that go more in depth about this law. Um, quickly going on to the next permitting uh, things. Again, this is just an overview of the law that was passed. So please feel free to go through that. As I said, municipalities that do not comply will be ineligible for housing choice grants, local ca capital project funds and mass works grants. So um, this will not go into effect till 2022, uh, but in 2022, if the communities are not in compliance, they will not have access to these grants. So it's sort of, we are glad that it pushes communities to sort of you know, use these tools and make sure that they are they're inclusive and are opening up um, their space for housing and affordable housing. This is just a map of the communities it applies to. And for more information, please feel free to check out these links, which has a lot more uh, in-depth information on exactly what this law does. And so going on from that, I think that is how we have sort of, you know, looked at our affordable housing priorities in terms of production. And that is what we are hoping to build on. Um, this was a really great start with it lifted certain barriers. It took into account that um, many of the communities, uh, you know, in the past have used zoning as a way of keeping certain community, so certain people out or certain communities out of their own, uh, you know, uh, communities. So we are glad that this law is there and we want to build on that and make sure we go forward and um, make make housing a priority and really give communities tools to um, use them so that they can you know make their own choices and um, build their own communities in a way that works for their populations and so our uh, before i get into those affordable housing priorities we uh, along with those we also want to make sure there is enough uh, revenue or enough resources for many of those uh, policies that we are working on. So budget is something that we always advocate for increased investments in uh, state housing programs like the mass rental voucher program, which we are glad to see got an increase. Uh, even the uh, alternative, alternative housing voucher program and public housing, which had not seen an increase for a long time, um, is now steadily uh, looking at increases over the last year and this year in, in their uh, in their, you know, funding. But also I want to uh, put a tag there that for the MRVP or mass rental voucher program, which is the state rental voucher program, uh, one of the things we are advocating for is the full expenditure of those funds. We have been seen that we have been seen over the last couple of uh, set years that not all of the funding that is allocated is being used. And that means that not all of the vouchers that could be put out are being put out. And so that is one of our priorities to make sure new vouchers are put out and more families get access to that program. Uh, and that is something that we'll be working on this year as well. 
uh, going forward, in, as I said, we are building on the zoning reforms that were passed. Uh, we just had a hearing on one of our housing production bills, which builds on the housing choice to um, set an affordable housing production goal. So it's not just housing goal, but we also ensure affordability is built into that. Uh, requiring multifamily around public transportation across all of Massachusetts and you know certain other things like inclusion in zoning and allowing uh, ADUs by right statewide. Um, also, we are looking at codifying MRVP, which makes the program more permanent and, and establishes it in statute instead of the budget, the way it is currently done right now, and so makes it more vulnerable to every year budget changes. So we just want to make sure that we are investing in programs that work uh, right to counsel uh, is, a, you know, another uh, bill that is currently in the legislature. Uh, our partners, uh, Mass uh, MLRI or Mass Law Reform Institute, are, you know, leading that, which helps sort of, which helps address the eviction crisis by providing full legal representation for residents with low income who are facing eviction, because we see that many are represented more than. Um, more significantly more than tenants are. And so this just provides a, a level playing field. And so that is some, because eviction is sort of the worst part of the housing crisis that we are seeing. And this is one way of um, addressing that. So those are some of the things we are working on, um, again, in terms of public housing, which is also a huge resource for affordable housing in Massachusetts, uh, but it's an old, the, the current public housing stock is a, you know, is, is many, many years old. And so we wanna make sure we are uh, creating resources um, that will allow housing authorities to leverage uh, more, you know, funding for rehabilitation and redevelopment projects for public housing, which is, which is, which is truly a, you know, dire need right now. Um, and also creating additional revenue for affordable housing so that, uh, so that the numbers work in terms of developing affordable housing. We know that um, it only works when there is enough uh, subsidies. And so anything that helps build uh, those resources on a community level is something that we see very helpful. And so increasing the deeds excise on buying and selling of property uh, would raise a huge amount of revenue um, and also help with the affordable housing you know, developments. And so that is something that we are working on. For a full overview of CHAPA's legislative priorities, please check out the links uh, in the chat. And uh, I am always here to help. Um, um, I, for I forgot there was one more slide. Uh, also, one big change that has happened on the legislative side was that we have two new uh, housing committee chairs. Uh, the Senate usually keeps, you know, they change many times, but the housing chair, uh, I want to recognize Representative Conan, who has been on the housing committee for a long time and was a leader in, you know, housing policies. And we now have a uh, representative, Arciero, who's also really responsive and, uh, you know, open to hearing about a lot of, you know, things that are going on in the housing side. And this is this also provides a chance for all of us advocates to sort of, you know, establish a communication line with the chairs and, you know, get get our issues and our solutions that we think work for our communities uh, heard by them and um, through hearings, but also through, you know, legislative meetings one on one are a great time to just, you know, convey uh, the issues that are, you know, happening in our community and what we want to see um, changes happen through policy or otherwise through the legislature. And so we uh, welcome all of you and encourage all of you to reach out to your legislators, but also to the housing committee chairs um, to make sure that your voices are heard. And uh, please feel free to um, use our help if you need to do that. Uh, we, are, we are always here to uh, make connections, to help you make connections with the state, legis state legislature. Um, with that, I think I am going to pass it on to Ryan, who is going to be talking about the federal stuff that is going Just on. One, sorry, Ryan, um, not to interrupt you before you go, but Abhi, there was one question in the chat for you, um, whether we'll be offering educational opportunities to learn more about 40A after DHCD issues guidance. Yes, we definitely, I mean, I, I think it's going to take a little bit time for DHCD to issue full guidance. They do have preliminary guidance on the uh, housing choice stuff, but uh, we are waiting on the full guidance and we definitely will be looking at doing more uh, educational, you know, uh, things on that because it's it's going to be a lot to figure out in terms of how it works in every community and in which scenarios, how does the law really apply? So uh, I, I 
we are with you in terms of you know trying to dig into it and figure out how what how how does that make sense for us so we are definitely looking to uh, have more webinars or more sessions once dhcd issues guidance for sure great thanks avi Perfect. Um, so yes, again, uh, I'm Ryan Dominguez and I'm a policy analyst for CHAPA uh, and I help to track all of the federal policies as well as the packages that have been coming out over the past year, including uh, the CARES Act and then this year the, with the American Rescue Plan Act, also known as ARPA. Uh, so these packages have brought in billions of dollars uh, in relief to Massachusetts. And I'll talk a little bit today about uh, some of the funding that is coming in for housing specifically. Um, so on the next slide, you'll see the first bucket of funding is called the fiscal recovery funds. And Massachusetts is eligible to receive around um, $8 billion uh, and you know $5 billion of that will be going directly to uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the state and you know probably put out by DHCD. Uh, and then the rest of the funding around $3.4 billion will go directly to cities and towns and uh, potentially counties. And these funds can be used to support everything from kind of public health, lost revenue, uh, infrastructure, and of course, housing. Uh, and you may have seen that there have been proposals kicked around uh, for how the state, as well as maybe some of your local municipalities, should use some of this money. I know that specifically Governor Baker has put out a proposal for around $1 billion of their total $5 billion uh, to be used specifically for housing uh, and for home ownership and rental housing production as the main priorities of that proposal. Uh, so last week, the state legislature actually had a hearing um, on how they should use some of these ARPA funds and uh, if they should use any of it for housing specifically. And uh, CHAPA, in addition to a lot of our partners, we came up with an additional $683 million that we're asking for on top of supporting uh, the governor's proposal. So in total, we're asking for around $1.683 billion. Uh, and I'll put in the chat now a little bit of a chart that breaks down some of our asks. Uh, but you'll see here that we're asking for um, affordable rental housing production and preservation, uh, housing re rehabilitation to make units more energy efficient, as well as to retrofit uh, existing units. Uh, we're asking for money for home ownership, public housing, acquisition, uh, supportive housing, as well as housing stability services, which is, includes uh, right to counsel um, and funding to go to directly to community-based organizations to really help to get out some of the kind of emergency rental assistance, which I will talk about in a few minutes. Uh, so uh, on the next slide, you'll see that uh, some of your local cities and towns and counties have received uh, fiscal recovery funds directly. Uh, specifically, Pittsfield has received around $32 million and Berkshire County, County will receive around $24 million. Uh, and if you don't fall under uh, one of these two uh, in terms of the allocation, uh, then you're probably within that non-entitlement community bucket. Uh, and with that, you'll be able to either apply through DHCD, uh, they're actually coming up with a process now on how they're going to allocate funding from the non-entitlement um, pot to some of the cities and towns across the state. Um, so with that said, you know, you as local advocates um, have a lot of say in um, potentially what this money can go to. Uh, so if your local government does receive uh, some of these funds, uh, you know, try to become part of the process and see if you can allocate some of that funding towards housing. Uh, in terms of eligible uses for the fiscal recovery funds directly, uh, you can advocate for your city or town to use it for rent, mortgage or utility assistance, uh, counseling or legal aid to prevent evictions, uh, affordable housing development, as well as services uh, to address homelessness, uh, such as supportive housing. And throughout this slide deck, I've included uh, the treasury guidance on all of the federal funds, which kind of outlines all of the eligible uses. So uh, please use that as a guide when you're trying to put together potential requests for your cities and towns. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see some of the other funding that has come in directly to the state. Uh, specifically, there's emergency housing vouchers, which are basically uh, your, your normal Section 8 housing voucher, um, but these are specifically targeted to people who have been experiencing homelessness, uh, domestic violence, or housing instability. Uh, 
And of the 1,000 or so that the state has received, uh, DHCD received the majority of them, uh, 917 to be exact. So if you know any uh, families or uh, people who are experiencing housing instability uh, or in a dire situation like this, uh, we recommend that they reach out to DHCD to see if they can get uh, one of these emergency housing vouchers. Uh, in addition, there's uh, the normal home funding that is coming in, uh, which can be used to create affordable housing uh, and provide supportive services specifically for those individuals who are experiencing homelessness or at risk of experiencing homelessness. And specifically, there's been around $125 million that came into the state. And of that total, uh, there's $36 million that will be going to uh, non-entitlement communities, uh, which may include some of your cities and towns. And then there's also uh, the Homeowners Assistance Fund, uh, which we actually just put out a letter um, to request that the uh, state actually ask for the full allotment from the federal government. And this funding can go directly to help people pay their mortgages and utility costs uh, in order to pre uh, prevent foreclosures. And then finally, on the uh, last page, you'll see uh, all the information about the emergency rental assistance programs that are coming in. This was the largest kind of uh, pool of funding that we've received. And we've been able to put out some of that money through um, RAFT and uh, some other newly created programs such as Shira and Irma. Um, and we're gonna really be focusing uh, over the next few months on trying to streamline that process so that uh, some of this funding gets directly into the hands of the people who need it, especially uh, to prevent evictions. Uh, and then finally, on the next page, you'll see that uh, the state created their own COVID-19 housing resources and guidance uh, page. Uh, and this has everything that uh, tenants and um, homeowners need to know about applying for rental assistance or, uh, you know, getting an attorney in an eviction proceeding. Uh, so there's a lot of great information for people to access there. Uh, and then on the next page, you'll see how you can kind of get get involved with CHAPA, uh, you know, specifically, uh, you can get involved with some of our committees, uh, but you as local advocates, again, uh, you have the power to reach out to your local municipal officials and ask for them to put some of this uh, ARPA funding towards housing, and we recommend that you do that. Um, if you have any questions on how to kind of uh, put together a letter or uh, what you should be asking for, feel free to reach out to us and uh, we can provide you with some of some guidance as well as some of the priorities that we're pushing as well. Uh, and with that, I will pass it on to my colleague, Whitney Demetrius. Thanks, Ryan. Actually, I'm going to pause there. I have a couple of questions in the chat for you. And then I wanted to open it up to our regional partners to, to speak on these items before we move on to the next section. So. In the chat, I see a couple of questions, uh, just going back up. Under the Berkshire County 24 million allocation, are you able to identify the communities that are in that? That's all the communities in the county. Is that correct, Ryan? Yes, uh, all of the communities in that county um, fall under that bucket. Um, but the al specific allocation will be based on a kind of formula that the state creates that uh, they'll look at what the needs are, what the uh, COVID-19 kind of infection rates are, and they'll try to allocate it that way. Great, and then there was a, another question, um, sorry. Um, any guidance on best practices for communities engaging the public on utilization of these funds? I assume ARPA funds, Brad, is what you're referring to? Yes. So, yes. Brian, you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, we're putting together uh, and we actually just had a meeting on Monday uh, with many of our local MEI communities uh, to try to start information sharing about what are some of the priorities that uh, people in different cities and towns are asking for? Uh, what is their process looking like? And uh, we're going to be uh, we put out a survey to try to collect some of this information and hopefully uh, we can have some follow up um, calls about what are some of those best practices practices. Uh, but again, uh, we can put out our CHAPA priorities and then uh, we're putting together kind of a guide of like what are some of like the 10 best things that local cities and towns can ask for, as well as what you should be kind of looking at in terms of racial equity uh, and trying to create more um, energy efficient units and that kind of thing as well. Um, so be on the lookout for those and uh, we'll be sending those over the next few weeks and months. Yes, and um, I'll ask Lily, while while I'm chatting, we'll go. The, the meeting on Monday was recorded. Um, so if folks missed that meeting, you can go ahead and watch it on our on our YouTube channel. And we also have materials from 
from that session, anyone who's interested in seeing those, I can forward those to all of you. Some really great resources that Ryan put together. We also had a speaker from the National Low Income Housing Coalition. There's some good resources out there about what other states and localities are, are thinking about using funds for and what's eligible. Um, so we'll, we'll pull all of that together um, and make sure that folks can view that as well. Um, so that's all the questions I see in the chat, but I wanted to open it up uh, to our regional partners to speak on what you're seeing locally and in your region around our state priorities and, and these federal funds that are coming. Um, maybe Brad, we'll start with you because uh, you had some great questions and then okay. we'll go from there. Um, so I, I, the issues I'm gonna identify, uh, I think we'll see kind of a theme here um, uh, across uh, a number of the participants' uh, uh, questions and also uh, issues that they're identifying. Uh, and uh, so what we know, and you've probably seen uh, statewide, is that the pandemic has exacerbated existing inequities. And uh, in areas where there already were high rates of poverty, uh, it's created the risk of additional housing instability. And um, that's uh, been driven uh, to even a higher level uh, with a dramatic increase uh, in the cost of rentals uh, in Berkshire County. Uh, there were, were always pockets that were extraordinarily high relative to income. Uh, and uh, we're seeing uh, that with the uh, ability to be more mobile to, by working remotely, more people have migrated uh, from larger urban centers with a higher level of income, uh, which has uh, gobbled up a lot of our housing stock. Uh, we didn't have a, an abundant housing stock to begin with, both on the rental side and uh, what's newer is more on the home ownership side where home ownership uh, was relatively affordable uh, and relative to rentals, that is. Uh, and now that uh, gap has kind of closed and they're both uh, 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 not terribly affordable, certainly to people that are uh, 80, uh, 50 and 30% of median income. So this is my long-winded way of saying that um, we're really looking, we're really facing um, I, th I think we throw this word around a lot, but I really think we're facing a crisis here uh, where uh, we could see homelessness spike. We certainly are gonna see an impact on uh, our economic growth where people can't afford to live in the community uh, and therefore they might not be able to work in the community. And so the answer to this is to uh, essentially build our way out of it. But um, we know that uh, doesn't happen easily or quickly. Uh, so um, I'm looking for ways that we can use some of the uh, identified changes, 40A uh, changes, as well as the, the federal resources to kickstart whatever we can uh, within the county. Uh, and, and that includes, because uh, we've seen this for the last decade, uh, a robust re uh, rehabilitation uh, program for our older housing stock, which may be the quickest and most affordable way uh, to get some um, units back online and keep them relatively affordable as well, especially with a lot of duplexes and triplexes in the urban centers that are underutilized because they're substandard or because rental property owners are the, um, which uh, those folks may be owner occupied may just need more housing counseling education, legal education, those sorts of things as well. So those are significant challenges. We're also seeing spikes in people seeking assistance for uh, foreclosure prevention. Uh, uh, and trying to access the, those resources which aren't readily available uh, yet, uh, especially for people over 80% of median income. Um, and in Berkshire County, you can very easily go from home ownership, uh, which could, could be relatively affordable for those people that have had home ownership for a while, uh, to homelessness because you can't uh, access a rental if you lose your uh, ownership. Um, so those, I don't wanna mo monopolize the time, but those are some of the uh, dynamics and issues that we're seeing within the county. Thank you, Brad. No, you were not monopolizing the time at all. This is really um, helpful context for the region. I, I appreciate you sharing. Um, our other regional partners, I see Elton, Elton Ogden, if you wanted to go ahead and, and share as well. And I know, um, you know, bittersweet news that you will be retiring at the end of this month. So we're, we're glad to have you here with us today um, to be able to, to share some thoughts um, before, before you move on to your next 
phase. But Elton, do you want to go ahead and speak? I'm just going to interject for one moment, okay. which is yep. just to say, like, uh, this is about Elton. And yes. so he's used yes. to me interrupting him. So this shouldn't be a, a <laughs> huge deal. And just to say that, you know, like, it's kind of melancholy because this is could be his last uh, chapa meeting. And uh, he, uh, you know, he's kind of like a housing development ninja like he's very low-key and quiet and you just you know you don't realize the powerful impact he has and he's developed like hundreds of affordable units in the county um he's a difference maker um and, and uh you know I, I i i it's funny because here we have a group of what i would kind of call housing development and uh, nerds and enthusiasts and he's a hero among those uh, housing development nerds because uh, they all uh, realize uh, how challenging it is to take something that's a concept and actually turn it into a building that houses people uh, and how hard that can be. And he, he makes it look as easy as he possibly can. So uh, we are all going to miss Elton a ton. He's, he's amazing. So I just wanted to add that. You're here as I hear, see people saying in the chat. So Elton, with that, I will pass it on to you to, to speak. Well, that was unexpected. I definitely, uh, Brad, I've always said you talk too much and that was a perfect example of it. <laughs> um, I, I don't really have anything prepared to, to say, but I, you know, I, I would, uh, I guess I would, um, I, certainly uh, the, the concerns that Brad outlined um, are, uh, you know, we're we're all any anybody who's paying attention is seeing that happen. Um, we've rapidly increasing costs, and and there's absolutely, you know, just looking at um, both from the rental side and from the the uh, inventory side of the kind of ownership market, it's it's a uh, pretty pretty dire um, out there. So. You know, we we have to we have to utilize these funds uh, uh, and use every dime that can be can be uh, captured in Berkshire County. There's no question about it. So, and I and I definitely you know having advocated for years um, at the with DHCD and and the legislature of, to try to uh, uh, expand housing rehab. Um, you know, maybe this is an opportunity where, where we really can make that happen. Um, it, it's a it's such a different game than it was because, unfortunately, you know the cost of cost of improvements and the cost of complying with codes and making houses safer is so much more um, costly than it was uh, in the past. That you know, no longer can the job be done with $30,000 or $40,000. It's it's really, we have very deteriorated housing stock. So we're talking about substantial investments of $100,000 per unit or more. But, you know, I feel like this, you know, these funds are an opportunity to, to do that. And um, if we can, you know, work together uh, with the you know, regional, um, Planning Commission, which has already got housing rehab programs that they operate, you know, we've kind of got a system in place. Um, it really is a, a great opportunity to just try to try to, to kind of take that program to scale, as as is true also with the city of Pittsfield's rehab program. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can just hopefully um, utilize some of these monies to expand expand the size of the programs. And then lastly, just, uh, you know, I am retiring from Berkshire housing, but I'm not going to be completely out of this world. So, you know, I, I, I have no doubt that I'll see, see some of you um, after September 1st, which I think is my official last day of Berkshire housing. Excellent. Thank you, Elton. And um, it's nice that I, you know, it would be nice to be in person, but it's also nice that for this meeting we have you on video and we can we can have have it in in uh, you know to go back and and uh, have your last meeting with us is actually uh, recorded um, that we can share. So thanks so much for that. Um, before we move on to Whitney's fair housing initiative um, presentation, just wanted to see if there's any other questions on this topic, um, and we can before we move move on. Okay, I don't see any. 
I do see a, there is someone on the phone and I just would, should remind folks that if you are on the phone and wanna um, unmute yourself, you just hit star six. Um, and so in case anyone's having issues unmuting themselves. Kamar, I, I see your hand question. raised. Yep, go ahead. Yes, um, for the regional partners, um, what is the best way to advocate for the use of um, the fiscal recovery funding for an expansion of the rehabilitation programs? We've seen very little conversation in the public um, in Pittsfield regarding that. So I would just suggest that maybe we circulate a petition um, with Pittsfield based um, developers and fair housing organizations to be presented at the city council. Um, and that is an action um, that you will have the support of the Berkshire County NAACP in pursuing, if you so choose to take it up. Thank you, Kamar. That's a great suggestion to be um, proactive. That's something that we were talking about in our session on, on Monday that, you know, even if it sounds like you have some good ideas here in the Pittsfield, uh, in Pittsfield and in the region, but even if you don't have ideas to, to not, uh, not stay quiet, to say there are things that you want to do with these funds and to really prioritize housing. Um, so we can communicate with folks on this list um, afterwards um, and share that, share that effort. Um, for you, Kamar. Great. And I do see a comment in the chat of you know making sure that some are not Pittsfield based. There are needs of smaller towns um, that are potentially more affordable but seem to be less fundable. And I think that's always important to to remind ourselves of. And hopefully there will be some efforts through the countywide and non entitlement funds that are available to to do that kind of work, Jane. So thank you for um, elevating that that issue. Yeah, and if I could just jump in real quickly and add on to that, in our meeting on Monday, I think some of those smaller towns uh, also had that shared that concern. And I think one of the things that they were talking about was potentially doing like a needs-based assessment that they can write a letter uh, so that, that we can actually let the government, the local government, as well as the state government know uh, that funds need to reach other places that are not in entitlement communities as well. So that might be an option. And I know that some of the smaller cities and towns are also talking about a collective effort and potentially pooling money together. And uh, that is something that we'll be looking into as well. Thank you, Ryan. All right, so we're gonna, I'm just gonna share my screen again and we'll move on to uh, Whitney. Whitney, thanks so much. Thank you, Dana. Uh, I've been encouraged by the conversation here as I heard for housing come up in several aspects of our of, of our conversation so far. Um, I am Whitney Demetrius. I am the Fair Housing Engagement Director here at Chapa. Really excited to be talking to you all about some of our fair housing initiatives here. Um, certainly our efforts and goal is really to eliminate housing discrimination and promote open communities throughout the state, right? Um, this premise that folks have the right to choose where they want to live, despite what their protected class status is, right? And everyone is a member of a protected class. So uh, we're certainly advocating for, for all in this space. Um, we heard some of what you guys have been talking about, about sort of exasperating um, the, the effects of COVID-19, um, really exasperating what has already existed in terms of the inequities we're seeing and what some of those fair housing impacts might be and right, de deteriorating um, housing stock, increased construction costs. So we're really excited to hear from you all about what you're seeing in your region. So it really informs some of the work we're doing here at CHAPA. Um, but in terms of that, we're also informed by what we are seeing federally. So I'm excited to, uh, to talk a little bit about the Biden administration's Building Back Better in Fair Housing, sort of focus around redressing discriminatory um, housing practices, um, sex discrimination, and affirmatively furthering fair, house, fair housing. So in terms of that, right, back in January uh, of this year, right in the onset of the administration, Biden, uh, administration issued a memo really on redressing our nation's um, federal government's history of discriminatory housing practices, um, taking all steps necessary to conform current HUD policies to the requirements of the Fair Housing Act. So I think this is really important because it's addressing the fact that there have been historical patterns of segregation and discrimination and really doing the work necessary to, to undo that. 
So that was exciting uh, to share in terms of the direction of the administration. Uh, secondly, uh, the following month in February, uh, the administration issued a memo through HUD um, on sex discrimination, right? We know here in Massachusetts, we are covered um, under sex discrimination um, as a state protected status. However, uh, included in that now is also the discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, right? Um, under the sex discrimination protected status. So this would mean that folks can file a complaint at HUD um, and the way that they are defining sex which formerly was male or female is now expanded. And so it's really um, important to note. Uh, lastly, uh, the restoring of the affirmatively fair housing uh, definitions, the interim rule uh, is now in effect as of July 31st, which was really restoring the uh, former affirmatively furthering fair housing rule that was very similar under the o Obama administration. So excited to also see that restored, although last year this time during our regional meeting, we were sharing some very different news about it being rescinded. Um, and so now the restoring of that is really hopeful in terms of fair housing. So we certainly are taking that into account into, um, in terms of our fair housing legislative priorities uh, which fit under these three buckets. So I'm excited to be able to share with our policy team, who you heard from uh, uh, earlier in our presentation, the priorities they put together around exclusionary zoning, disparate impact, and affirmatively furthering fair housing. Uh, so prohibiting exclusionary zoning uh, really has to do with land use zoning and permitting decisions that perpetuate segregation, right? It will mean that it will prohibit discrimination against affordable housing developments or housing that is suitable for children, for example, right? Um, and so this certainly we've heard as a barrier to a lot of the work that you all have done on the ground. And so um, this is a piece of legislation we're continuing to push. More recently, we've added affirmatively furthering for housing on the state level, sort of mirroring um, what they have done, been able to do in California. This will create a statewide duty to affirmatively furthering, right? So now we have the restored piece on the federal level, but what does it mean despite what the administration might be and, and, and making sure there's an affirmative obligation for communities, cities and towns to create uh, also a commission to establish how communities will meet this duty to affirmatively further fair housing. I'm uh, so excited about that. And then lastly, the disparate impact piece, which will create a standard to protect people against housing discrimination um, based off a of practice or policy, despite what the intent of that policy or practice may have been to discriminate, but that it has an effect on protected class members. Um, and so uh, in addition to that, in terms of our statewide work, we certainly are, are in our municipal engagement initiative are in tune with you all in terms of the local uh, level initiatives you all are doing. We certainly want to hear from you all even during our discussion on what you all are working on uh, on the ground, but certainly there are commissions and committees and human rights commissions and diversity and equity inclusion officers, right? And like organizations doing work around education and outreach, providing assistance for people um, who've experienced discrimination and local and state policy advocacy to promote open communities. So if you're interested in learning more about fair housing and or how to start one of these advocacy committees in your local city or town, we are sharing some links with you uh, in the chat around how to do that. But lastly, I'm excited to share about our Fair Housing Committee. We have revitalized our Fair Housing Committee. We're meeting periodi periodically with diverse stakeholders, stakeholders, but we wanna make sure our diversity also has to do with regionally. So we wanna make sure that we have representation from your region and our group to inform the policy, the outreach and the work that we're doing. Uh, so certainly invite you to join that effort if you have an interest. So as much as you can do, right? You can join a local effort, you can establish, revitalize and or expand the, your already um, established for housing committees and commissions. You can contact your municipal officials and decision makers and state, state legislators, and certainly to join our fair housing uh, committee. So again, we invite you to reach out to us if you have questions about it, but certainly 
um, we reach out if you're interested in joining the effort, because even if you're retiring, right, Elton, if you're retiring, you're interested in doing some work with us on the ground, we're really interested in having as many folks um, and minds uh, on the work and in the field. So I'm excited now to pass it over to Dana to talk a little bit more about our municipal engagement initiative uh, work that we do on the local level. Thanks, Dana. Thank you, Whitney. So I'm gonna go through a little bit about our municipal engagement initiative. Whitney works within the municipal engagement initiative. So fair housing is really built into what we do, um, but just a little bit about what we do and why we do it um, at, here at Chapa. So we the, the program started with this premise that was really highlighted through a, a report out of BU by um, Catherine Einstein, David Glick and Maxwell Palmer. Um, you can learn more about it at housingpolitics.com and I would encourage you to go and check that out and, and read into it a little bit more. But it's about um, what they were calling neighborhood defenders and they essentially were looking at who participates in meetings and um, speaks up about housing at the local level. They did this by looking at meeting minutes from um, hundreds and hundreds of meetings around housing production and affordable housing production. A caveat, they did do this research in the greater Boston area, but we, um, th through working with them, did ask them to dig into it for several other regions and the data that they found there carried over to other regions as well. So I think it's relevant to pretty much any community in the United States, certainly in Massachusetts. So they essentially compared uh, people who commented at public meetings and compared with voters, they found that the commenters were disproportionately white male, older, and more likely to be homeowners. Um, these trends persisted across high and low cost cities and towns, um, and people were speaking at these meetings in opposition generally to more housing and more affordable housing, not in support. And what that led to was the loudest voices, the most common voices were opposed to more production. And so we end up with an inadequate supply of housing particularly in highly desirable neighborhoods where people were more motivated to come out and speak. Um, and this can lead to, you know, essentially a neighborhood defense in advantaged communities. So nothing gets built there. It pushes development into less affluent communities and that can lead to gentrification and displacement and becomes this, this cycle that is really disappointing. And you guys probably have all seen this in your, in your work. This is no surprise, but it's nice to see that um, supported through research so we can really um, dig into it. So knowing that, this is, this is what this looks like on the ground, right? You drive around your community and you see these signs, stop the whoppers, no, we don't want this affordable housing development. This is where low income housing is gonna be. We don't want it, you know, right size. This is not, this is not the kind of community, the kind of development we want in our community. Most communities in America, there's there's things like this happening on the ground. And we wanted to go from an environment where this was the norm to an environment where this is the norm, where people are, are standing out and saying, protect and expand our affordable housing. And yes, we want this kind of housing in our community. We know people feel this way at the local level, but they're not as motivated and, um, and moved to speak up for it. So knowing that community support can make or break housing at the local level um, and that many communities have no strategy or coalition to build that local support, that's where the municipal engagement initiative came in. So we really try to work at the local level, support communities to build a culture that's welcoming to housing, um, particularly affordable housing as opposed to being um, against it. We bolster local efforts that are already happening in the local community. And we really try to grow the number of people supporting production in, in their communities. Like Kamar was talking about, how do we get more people to sign petitions? How do we get more people to show up to meetings um, in every community? Uh, we think that there's pretty much no community in Massachusetts that wouldn't benefit from some more advocacy for affordable housing. So we do this through uh, a pretty, in, intensive process with communities that we call our Municipal Engagement Initiative or MEI communities. Um, but we also have a toolkit that you can find on our website, our MEI Light toolkit that kind of goes through sample agendas and stakeholder lists and activities that you can do to build a coalition. 
Um, really what we're operating under is this idea of building a bigger tent, a builder, bigger group of people who are willing to speak out for housing. And so we do that by identifying a core of people who are really committed to that, building out broader sets of partners, really going beyond the usual suspect. So um, if people are talking transportation, if they're talking sustainability, if they're talking Black Lives Matter, if they're talking food justice, we believe they should be part of the housing conversation because it is all so interconnected. Um, we have these conversations with people. We really do a deep data dive. We always uh, dig into Data Town, uh, MHP's tool for um, learning more about your local housing environment. Um, and then we launch, we have a big event or a meeting and we try to help these coalitions grow and, and take action. So I, when I do these kinds of com, uh, conversations with folks and I say what it takes to get a, a full uh, coalition up and running, I get a lot of people saying, well, that's too much. I don't think I have the time to do that or that's gonna take a lot of effort or how long does it take to see some results? Um, so I share this slide because I think there's always something that you can do in the meantime, even if you're not ready to build a full out coalition through the steps that we identified. So these are some things you can, you can do right now, any one of you. You can dig into your local housing data. As I mentioned, Data Town is a great place to start. You can go onto your website, learn a little bit more about uh, what's happening in your town. You can always request a meeting with your local planners and your elected officials to better understand what they're hearing, what they're seeing, what the climate is, what resources they think might be available. Um, this is a really great moment to be doing that as ARPA funds come into communities to say, what do you think our priorities should be? You can always show up to public meetings and speak up for more housing and more affordability. And in fact, you should always show up to public meetings. This is so important. If we remember the fact that people who don't want housing and don't want affordability happening in their communities, they are motivated to show up. We have to show up and say, we are um, interested in this happening and, and we want these resources to go to affordable housing in our communities. You can always push back against myths and exclusionary language and concerns. By this, I mean, Sometimes people will say, you know, oh, we, we, we'd love to build that, but it's going to just create too much traffic, or we'd love to build that, but only if it's for seniors because our school system can't handle more students. Dig into that a little bit. Ask them really what are their concerns. Say, you know, actually our school system's been seeing a decrease in school population, and we have the room in our, in our schools for that. Or, you know, yes, I'm concerned about traffic, but what are the mitigation efforts that we, that we might be able to take on? There's always room for educational forums in communities. We'd love to help you put that together. And lastly, uh, but not least, is to listen to the people with the deepest affordability concerns in your community. Um, often the voices of people who are the end users of affordable housing or policies and programs are not heard at the municipal level. Um, and so finding ways for, for them to, to speak, supporting them in ways that they can speak, looking at your meetings, are they accessible? Are they, uh, you know, if you need translation, are they translatable? Are they, are your meetings happening at times that people can make it to? Are you breaking down whatever barriers there might be so that people with the deepest affordability concerns can be heard? Um, take a look at that. So with that, I'm gonna pause um, my sharing. I know we've already heard from our regional partners, um, but wanted to offer them the ability to to speak on, on these topics and any other concerns that they're hearing. And then we will open it up to, to questions. So um, Brad or Elton, any, anything you wanna add to the conversation at this point? Oh, there you are. Brad, we, we hear you, but we can't see you. Seems, there you yeah, are. Yeah, so um, I, you know, I thought you did an excellent job and I, I think a lot of those dynamics that you talked about in more general terms are, issues that we're contending with in Berkshire County. Uh, and we do, uh, through the Regional Planning Commission, have a group of folks and we're, uh, and we're trying to grow that a little bit too, but uh, looking at uh, those challenges in terms of development where historically uh, there have been communities that disproportionately have had to take on the issue of affordable housing for other communities that are less willing to do so. Um, and how do we uh, address that issue um, uh, both uh, from a pragmatic perspective in terms of like people want to be able to live in those communities and closely linked to that uh, is really 
uh, an equity issue as well. Uh, so uh, we're, we're you know, trying to tackle that. And I mean, these themes, they may be uh, identified in slightly different ways, but we, we know they've existed for a long time. Um, I think what's a little bit different this time is there seems to be a greater uh, societal awareness. Uh, there's a greater focus on housing and housing as a, an equity issue uh, in particular. Uh, and um, I think there's resources too that have never been, or at least in my career, uh, available to this level. And maybe that's a way to engage and bring people to the table that otherwise would not uh, be coming to the table. But I do think as this regional planning group, uh, which is through uh, Berkshire Regional Planning, they're spearheading it, might benefit actually from uh, in, engaging CHAPA on, on uh, some of the issues that we're grappling with uh, as we as we move this process forward, so I would put that out there. Yeah, we would be happy to do that. Um, we're we're willing to speak to anyone and everyone. Um, and actually, this this is a good time for me to mention a couple of resources that we have through our municipal engagement initiative that are open to anyone throughout the Commonwealth. Um, first of all, we have office hours. Lily Link, um, my colleague, raising her hand there um, has office hours every week. So folks who are interested in just chatting about what's going on in their community uh, around housing advocacy um, can schedule some time to meet with her during those office hours or if they don't work for you, um, she's very flexible to find time to meet with folks um, and either help strategize or direct you to the right resource that, that could help you. Um, we also run an affordable housing 101 session um, generally every month, although we're skipping August. So our next one will happen in, in September. And this is a really good way as you're having conversations with folks and this, this awareness you were talking about, Brad, where people are starting to be more aware that housing is so critical. Uh, it is a solution to so many of these areas of inequity and people are getting excited about it. Um, they may not have all the tools or all the language to understand what, what are the strategies that we, that we might have our, at our disposal. So it, in our Affordable Housing 101, we go through the alphabet soup, the definitions, the various tools, and give people a lot of resources that they might be able to access. Those meetings um, are always um, simultaneously interpreted into Spanish as well. Um, so feel free to refer folks as you're having conversations with them um, to that session. We'd love to have anyone and everyone join us for that. And then lastly, we have a working group that we bring together called Making the Case where we really, it's a peer-to-peer -peer group. We at CHAPA facilitate it, but really what we're trying to, to accomplish in that working group is bringing together advocates from local communities to share their challenges, their strategies, what's worked, what hasn't worked. We do a lot around how do we, how do we build this, this broad coalition? How do, we, uh, how do we pivot away from opponents who wanna um, stop the work that we're trying to do? Um, and so we would in, encourage you all to get in touch with us to, um, to join us for those meetings as well. Um, Elton, anything you wanna, you wanna add to the conversation on that? Or um, with that, I can open it up to, to discussion from the group to questions and comments uh, from all of you, really on our presentation or really anything that you're seeing in your communities, in your region that you would like um, CHAPA to either be looking into or to focus on. So feel free to raise your, your virtual hand or your, um, your real hand if you have any comments. Kamar, I see you. Yep, go ahead. So Whitney, you gave us a phenomenal presentation and overview of um, new federal guidance of, um, around AFFH. And I'm curious <clears throat> if, and this is kind of going along with Brad's earlier question, of best practices for the use of these funds. Have you seen any municipalities in the state really engage around um, maybe Boston's recent AFFH zoning ordinance as a template and a model um, for developing criteria for developments that would use ARPA funds? Ah, that we use ARPA funds. I think that's a that's a really good point because I think what you're getting at, right, is this idea that 
there's this obligation if you're using these funds to then to affirmatively further fair housing. Um, and Kamar, just uh, just to give a little more context for folks, right? In Boston, uh, for others, right? Uh, in Boston, what they've done, uh, Councilor Lydia Edwards has pushed um, and worked on affirmatively furthering for housing, right? Connected to uh, potential development at, in the zoning, right? So, so linking, how do you sort of create this incentive to affirmatively further for housing um, through the zoning bylaws when there is a, a new development, right? And I think it's it's something that not only here in the state, other local com uh, communities, cities and towns are looking at to emulate, but certainly across the country, right? Um, and so I think it's really monumental. We're excited to have her uh, and others from the, um, the community council, advisory council, who are part of our fair housing committee that are really helping us to, uh, to think through the work that we're doing around our policy work. But also I think to your point about it being linked to ARPA funds um, is really unique. It is, is one that I, um, that I haven't heard sort of brought into the conversation, but I think folks should be considering. Um, and of course, I'm going to give a selfish plug to kind of get you into, uh, get you looped into our committee work, right? Um, these are the sort of questions um, that, as a result of meeting in these regional spaces, that really help um, bring bring val validity really to our to our efforts. But certainly, we have been working, as Dana mentioned, with local cities and towns about how to frame how the, the funding can be used for housing specifically, but um, I'm, I certainly can lean upon my colleague, uh, Robert Terrell, who is from the city of Boston and from the CAC there informing, working with Council um, Lydia Edwards around um, that particular policy, but certainly thinking about that is an important link there, right? If they're using those, that funding, how to obligate folks further. I love the question. I love the ideas. Uh, keep them coming. I hope I can, again, give myself this plug because these are the sort of innovative things that we want to be part of the discussion and the work we're doing moving forward. Love it. And Ryan, I don't know if you, does that seem like an eligible use or is that something we should look into? Um, um, I mean, it should be a requirement, right? Or yeah, I mean, for ARPA uh, specifically, maybe the fiscal recovery funds, it does give you some broad flexibility uh, to address um, social um, inequities that were in place like during and even before kind of the pandemic or that have been exacerbated by the pandemic, I, I mean to say. Um, but just to kind of also say, uh, in addition to ARPA, right now, there's some talks around an infrastructure package. And originally, when Biden put out his plan for an infrastructure package, there included a lot of money uh, that was going to go towards housing and specifically to close some of these kind of racial inequities in home ownership and fair housing. Um, but that was not included in the package that is kind of going through the House and the Senate right now. Uh, but with that said, they are trying to push that conversation into kind of a reconciliation process where there may be funding coming down the pipeline for that. Uh, so within the next few months, especially when they come back from their August recess, uh, there's going to be a lot of talk about that kind of second avenue uh, to push some more housing resources. So I would also say, you know, be on the lookout for that. Uh, and we might be able to apply it towards some of our fair housing initiatives. And I think the, the last thing I would say on, on that topic is that um, Councillor Edwards has been willing uh, to go to any community that, as far as I can tell, that invites her to speak on the, on the topic of Boston's provisions. Um, and so if you're interested, or as Whitney said, we have some, some of our colleagues within our Fair Housing Committee who were instrumental in, in implementing that. Um, so if folks are interested in learning more about it at, at your local level, reach out to us and we can hopefully make that connection. Great. Any other questions or comments? Kamar, you have another one? Yeah, go for it. Of course I have another one. Please, I do. Um, <laughs> well, we've, we've been in enough meetings with you and we really appreciate it. Uh, go for it. Y'all have taught me so much um, and encouraged me to speak up. So all I can do is pay it forward, right? So um, I had mentioned. Um, 
And this was the topic of the Monday meeting, right, is drawing public input into this process with the fiscal recovery funds. And I'm curious if you guys have seen any um, folk in the state work to maybe expand the municipality's infrastructure to like um, pull in public input, right? So we've gone through this Zoom year, which has in some ways improved access to public meetings. Um, and I'm wondering if you guys have seen anything in addition to that. Um, and really, I just kind of want to plug a particular model that I saw out in Lakewood, Colorado. So that's what my question is really about is how can folk who are on this call, if they're so interested, um, how can we organize around um, increasing public input um, in an equitable way so that we hear from more stakeholders? Um, yeah, I'd be curious for the rest of the group to chime in. Yeah, I'd love to hear from the rest of the group too. And I wanna dig into the um, article that you shared because I hadn't seen that one. I mean, I think we in our municipal engagement initiative are always thinking about how can we do that better? Cause it's it's not just at the municipal level, right? We're all trying to do this work. Um, certainly some communities are continuing to keep the, um, the ability for folks to call in or zoom into public meetings so that they don't have to physically be in the space um, because that can provide a real barrier. Um, we are always thinking about the time that meetings happen and how how input is given you. There's historically there's this idea that you have to show up physically to a meeting for your for your comment to really carry weight. But can people be compiling um, written comments and then have one person go to the public meeting and read them into the record so that it's you both don't have to show up but you can actually have your voice heard in that space um we are always encouraging our communities especially those that are have um multiple languages that are spoken in their communities to have translation services to have materials written into multiple languages um and at the municipal level i think we've seen more more communities relying on you know web-based tools so um having websites where they're actually seeking input on projects as they're going forward as opposed to just waiting for for public meetings to happen um we were in lynn last night for our well in lynn on on a zoom call um but the planners there shared a, a website called lynn in common where they're putting out as they're working on plans they're on a website and people can actually be submitting comments um on an ongoing basis. Um, and we also have communities that use tools like co-urbanize. Uh, Whitney could probably speak a little bit more to that because I know she's worked with them, but you know, allowing people to submit comments as they're walking down the street, there's a sign that says like, what do you want to see in this location? Or what, what would make your, your life easier at this bus stop or things like that? Um, just really leaning on all the tools that we have at our, at our disposal. I don't know, Whitney, if you want to add um, to that a bit. Yeah, no, I, I, I love the question. I think, um, and to your earlier point, Kamar, about how do we point to communities who are doing this well, right, as a model. Um, so certainly, um, as Dana mentioned, the Linen Common website, there has there have been a uh, really a revitalization in the space to create different ways to engage uh, the community that certainly we can point to right in Revere they have a zoning board of uh, of appeals tracking site so you can kind of get a sense of what new developments are happening in what communities at any given time, right? Um, there's all of these different things that I think people are more so leaning uh, on different, different aspects of communication to really get at your point, which is to make sure that there are more equitable uh, involvement and inclusion in the space and in the conversation about what gets built for whom and where and, and all of those things, right? Um, and so I, uh, I think part of what we've been discussing as well in our municipal engagement initiative work is how do we sort of create something uh, where we can point to, right? Where we can point to communities who are doing this well so that other communities can really emulate um, what they're seeing uh, as successful in other communities, really getting at that goal uh, of inclusion um, in the space. And certainly Co-Urbanized has some great uh, models around how they've been able to do that well. 
uh, right? And so sort of breaking down this idea, as Dana said, where folks have to be in person uh, to be part of the conversation and to, to have their comments weighed more heavily. Um, but certainly we know even historically how there have been barriers around certain people participating in that space. Um, as well. So I think uh, there there's so many uh, different pieces that we in our program really try to get at to encourage folks along the way. And, um, and there are so much at our disposal. But again, oftentimes it's tied to money, right? And so how do we also think about what that means for communities to be able to allocate their their budgets around how to get at those barriers, right? Having meetings at different times, having Zoom accounts that will account for more than 100 people participating, having um, food, right? <laughs> Available or childcare, right? There, there's a cost there. And so oftentimes we say in our work there, you know, your budget is often where your heart is, right? How do you include that, um, that, that intention within your budget as well uh, in the work? So certainly there are, examples and models and uh, pieces of carbonizes examples as well we could point to. But I, I love the question because I think there's an opportunity here, right? Even in the last year that we've experienced about what went well with that, that we can carry forward, um, but also uh, what we can learn from that to do even better. Thanks Dana for sharing that link. I knew, I knew between you and Lily, I'm like, it was someone coming, to, you know, I'll get there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I knew someone would share that. So yeah, um, Dana has shared the co-urbanized website uh, in the chat. We encourage you all uh, to check them out as well. So I um, we have a few minutes left. Are there, if there are any other questions or comments from the group, I'll, I'll um, pause to give space for that here. But if not, just a couple of closing things that I um, wanna make sure, just again, to remind everyone, please do join our committees. Uh, you heard Whitney asking certain people to join based on their comments. That is really where we, we, um, we dig into ideas and policies. That's where we start to set our priorities um, and where we wanna focus our efforts. And it's really critical that we have that um, diverse group of voices in the room and, you know, the ability to do these meetings over Zoom has opened up, you know, you don't have to drive several hours to join us in the CHAPA conference room anymore. We do want you to be able to engage with us. So please do join our committees. You can learn all about that on our website. Um, if you do want to engage with the Municipal Engagement Initiative in any way, uh, please follow up with Lily for office hours or, or sign up for any of our meetings um, as we go forward. Um, and just want to say thank you to all of you for, for being here today, um, for joining us. Um, and please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, after the meeting with any questions. Um, and lastly, thank you again to, to Brad and to Elton um, and our regional co-sponsors for, for supporting us and uh, this work. And best of luck, Elton, to you. And as you know, Usually when people retire in this field, um, they get busier with all of the, the committee work that <laughs> people start to ask them to do. So um, as you said, I'm sure we'll, we'll still be seeing you around um, in this work as we go forward. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>